I can code 10, 12, 13, 15 hours straight without even a sip of water. Post my masters, I joined a company and left within two months. Like a company could be good for everybody else, but it might not be good for you. Everybody is good with lead code and everybody will think the exact same way and the product will look exactly like every other product. So what are some things that people should consider hmm. while thinking of switching? The day you are not getting is the time you switch. If you're still craving in your 30s that education system is bad, then something's wrong with you. I did a tweet another day talking shit about LinkedIn and another person took my tweet, copy pasted it on LinkedIn and they got re more reach than me. Because I don't want people who are good at cracking interviews and really bad at making real world impact. Hi Arpit, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? Yeah, all good, life's great. Amazing. Before we start, um, for somebody who might not know you, would mm. you like to give a short intro about who Arpit Bhyani is, what he does, what he stands for? Hey, so uh, my name is Arpit. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CTO of Dugup. We have not launched yet. We are still in stealth, uh, trying to build a no-nonsense social platform for people in tech. Mm -hmm. um, but apart from this, uh, I basically what I love doing is I love to spark engineering curiosity. So I've been writing on LinkedIn, Twitter, through my newsletter since last eight years. Mm -hmm. Every single day, uh, two to three posts every single day, all no nonsense. Basically, that's who I am. I don't like to put out very fluffy stuff. I want to keep it crisp, very uh, focused on knowledge and all. So that's who I am. Um, really curious, really passionate engineer from inside. I can code 10, 12, 13, 15 hours straight without even a sip of water. So, yeah, really, really passionate about engineering. Okay, that's your tagline. No yeah. fluff engineering. No fluff it's engineering. everywhere. Yeah. So, this is what we will try to do in this episode. No fluff. We'll talk about engineering because you've been a staff engineer at Google and you've had more than a decade of experience in the same. Um, and we'll also delve into entrepreneurship uh, because that's what you're doing yeah. at Dug Up right now. We will also get some general career advice from you. And we'll also delve a little into social media. As you mentioned, you're super consistent with it. So to the listeners, if this is what interests you, you should keep watching. Um, Arpit, I want to start from the very basic. Mm. So uh, let's talk about from the perspective of somebody who is just starting out engineering or is, is probably uh, looking at engineering as a field of study, as a field of practice. Mm. Um, what, like, How do you know that this is a career field where you can thrive. Now, oh. everybody seems to go for engineering because it pays well yeah. and there is again a lot of fluff around it. But how do you know that this is a field where you can do good at? <laughs> is it about innately having that passion, innately having talent or can it be built um, over time? So I want to know what your opinion is. That's a really good question. Now, if I were to look back on uh what made like like why I chose this field or like how did I realize that hey I want to do this? Uh, one thing was problem solving. Right, I like I used to solve a lot of math questions in school. I loved maths. I gave a lot of competitive exams around that, around basically speed, distance, time, time and work, all these mm -hmm. questions, bunch of puzzles. I used to solve a lot of books by basically Shakuntala Devi, all of that stuff. So I had that knack of solving problems. Um, but when I entered this field. Um, I realized that this is exactly what we do and that resonated with me really well. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that I realized for someone to have a thriving career uh, or to know if this field is for them or not, first basic preliminary thing is you should be a good problem solver and it does not mean to just write code to solve a problem but given a problem, how do you approach it? Do you approach it in a structured way? Mm -hmm. Do you or, or, or you or you basically panic? Right? Mm -hmm. If you panic, then this field might not be for you because you would be thrown problems every single day. In some or the other capacity, some problem would be relatively simpler, some problem would be relatively tougher. That's one. And second is you need to be a constant learner. So these two, according to me, are the bare minimum criteria for which you would know that this domain is for you. Given how rapidly the field changes, you have to constantly keep learning new stuff, be it architecture, system design, new programming language, new framework, new way to write code, what not, right? So, according to me, the two things that would like to summarize two things would be problem solving skills and you being a constant learner. Okay. So, problem solving, uh, let's talk about that hmm. for a sec. So, that's, do you think that's something that a person innately has? That's like a part of their 
character in some way soft skill hmm. or can it be built over time let's say if a problem is thrown at me let's say i panic hmm. but i have enrolled for an engineering course now i have to be a good problem solver so how can i build that i'll give you a very nice analogy um the people who choose to become a doctor have they started operating when they are born or when they are kid mm-hmm. no right they learn right same thing goes for us right it's not that you have to be a problem solver from day 0 or like as a kid but you should have that attitude to learn and which is where the constant learning part comes in because yeah. because you because you can learn anything and in you over time you would build that knack build that uh, you would build that habit to solve any problem right, right? but and again with respect to uh, like basically people panicking it's a very common thing but over time when you are thrown into that situation like almost every single day you you get habituated yeah right, right. so over time you would build uh you like you would you would get your you would get your basically calmness you would be you would get your composure over time so not a roadblock roadblock like you need to be talented from your childhood but you can but have that attitude to learn which is why i believe like ability to learn and being a problem solver goes hand in hand right you need right. to have the right attitude and have a knack of learning mm-hmm. and you would be able to right okay now rolling back to my hmm. uh, main question which was how to know if you're thriving hmm. uh, in engineering okay it's a mix of having problem solving yeah. skills and being willing to learn constantly throughout your career hmm. but um, let's say if somebody is, has just started out with their first job hmm. and um, as you said it's important to like learn on the go learn yeah. on the job and when you just start out with corporate you really don't know much about hmm. it you have zero experience you are in this you're being thrown into this real world all of a sudden so there comes a lot of a uh, lot of problems and difficulties right. that a lot of um, new joinees face so one of these problems are like having bad work culture having mm. uh, not having uh, good leadership mm. at the workplace how do you advise people to deal with that so when you are just joining a company no one knows what's good what's bad that's given right mm-hmm. so whatever is thrown at you yeah it's thrown at you you be the judge if it's good for you or not right there is no like i like post my masters i joined a company and left within 2 months yeah it was not because of a bad manager or bad days it was just not meant to be like uh, for me i do a very simple like you know it was not meant to be i know i it's very simple i'm i'm really a very simple guy for me it's very simple uh, if i lose the smile on my face i stop doing what i'm doing simple oh, okay simple like for example if let's say if if let's say uh, the, i'll go home after recording this and um, i have to write a linkedin post but while writing if i'm not having a smile on my face i don't write mm. because i know i'm doing it forcefully yeah. same thing when i was at job my first job which i left in 2 months i was not feeling happy going to that place mm-hmm. i'm like is this place right for me i don't think so i'm not finding that vibe yeah. right and that happens like some things and it's not that the place was not good it's still india's one of the best employers out there but not meant to be not meant to be right yeah. but that decision looked very abrupt my parents reacted very differently at that time but then seeing me join a startup and then build a thriving career they are now happy yeah, right? yeah, yeah. because eventually having the right attitude just just magically does the wonder for you yeah that that's right. true having a right attitude is so important not just for your career but for everything yeah. in your in your life and yeah like a company could be good for everybody else but it might not be good for you yeah. right um you switched your first job in 2 months mm. that's uh, i haven't seen a lot of people do that and also it said that you shouldn't um stop working in an organization uh, before a year yeah. like it yeah. doesn't look yeah. good on your resume at all so i've seen a lot of people work their jobs for at least a year just mm. to like keep their resume looking neat mm. so h- how do you know when to switch like okay you said that you lose a smile on your face and you stop yeah. working but that might not be the case for everybody and also uh, there are a lot of things to consider like their need for the job their uh, like the yeah. economy if the market is too bad you can't leave your job yeah. so what are some things that people should consider hmm. while thinking of switching 
Okay, so uh, the example I gave you about not losing the smile on my face was the way I judged it when I was young. Right? Today, I, I apply that not for my career most, but I apply it for my day to day. Like, like basically when I write on my post or I record a YouTube video and whatnot. But the way I look at it is uh, when I, if I look at it like, the factors that affect this is obviously market. If market is good, then a lot of decisions are simpler. Right? Yeah. If sure. market is bad, stay wherever you are. Right. For example, if if we were to talk about this today, don't leave your job. Yeah. Don't. Market is really bad. Unless right? you have a better offer. Unless you even if you have better offer, you don't know if that company would be surviving or not for yeah. a month. And it's and because you don't know, like you see you see a lot of big companies firing, but then giving out, let's say we are hiring. We'll basically firing from one geography, hiring in another another geography. And from there, where we saw a hiring post, then you you in few months you see they have basically fired a few teams. Yeah. Call that happens. promises just it's uh, it's weird. Don't hold. But we understand that business is important. Mm -hmm. uh, company is there to survive. They have, they are quite accountable to their shareholders and all. So it's there. But on the personal front, it's important to know that uh, the biggest factor of you having that privilege to switch is a good market. First, right. if good market is not there, even good engineers stand no chance. Right. After good market comes you as a person, like how value, like how much of a value are you adding? Mm -hmm. That comes. So, for example, if you know you have always had a past impactful career, you made real world impacts wherever you worked and people recognize you for that, then the switch becomes relatively easier. Right? But if you were just a coder sitting in the corner, mm -hmm. then it becomes more tougher for you. Yeah. right? Because you don't have proven impact. You were just surviving and not thriving. Yeah. Right. So these these factors affect a lot. But now assuming that uh, the market is good, you are also good engineer having the right attitude. Now how do you decide? I have a very cliche three P formula. I you know I uh, you know after you know after ten years you 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 become a philosopher. Yeah. That that kind <laughs> of stuff. Happened. So I'm in I'm in that I'm in that state. So I have a very simple formula to judge. Uh, 3P formula. Uh, first P is Paisa, money. Second P is power, which is your core competency. And third P is position, which is growth. Right. So at a company where you're working, you should get at least two out of this three. Mm -hmm. At least two out of this three. If you get three, then you are the luckiest person on earth. Don't leave. But you should get at least two. At least, for example, if you are not getting money, then you should get at least the career growth. Right. Or uh, basically your core competency should become high so that you are basically it's okay to sacrifice money. Yeah, because you are getting good because at your you are you, because you are growing in your career mm -hmm. with respect to positions. Yep. Like you are you are basically taking up more responsibility. Right. Then it's okay to sacrifice on money. Mm -hmm. Right. On other case, if you don't want to sacrifice on money or rather if you are being paid well and let's say you are not growing in your career, then what's the point of having very deep expertise? Yeah. Right. So this is how I judge. Like whenever I see diminishing returns, where I have two out of, like where I'm just getting one out of this three, I make a switch. Mm -hmm. And but again, you very rightly said that you should not be switching too often. Like I switched my first job in two months because uh, the other opportunity was exciting. It was not meant to be. That's why I left. But now after that, whenever I switched, I always thought about this. But now I've given it a name, three P. But uh, earlier it was more about, uh, hey, I'm getting money and I'm getting growth. That's how I used to think. But now it's a now it is something that I have that I always tell to folks. Like think of your switch. Like uh, basically think of your switching criteria as three P. Out of this three, the day you are not getting uh, two out of this three is the time you switch. Uh, and that's an easy way to look at you it. You should aim for two. You should you should be getting two. You sh okay, should be getting two and like aiming for three. Two. Three is very difficult to get. Three is like ideal company. Imagine yeah. the company that pays also well, gives you core competencies also. Right? Yeah, Plus is also. giving you career growth also. It's it's they are they are like unicorns, not not in terms of valuation, but they are like really mythical animals hard yeah. to find. Right? Yeah. But do but but there are companies who are in very early stage solving really tough problems mm. and you join them early and in a month or sorry, you know, year or two, the company grows, you grow, you have grown technically. Like mm. imagine early days of Google, like first three years of Google. Yeah. 
those were the time you would have gotten all three yeah. paisa power position right mm -hmm. but obviously over time a lot of things change and true for every company but that is been my criteria of judging and whenever i speak to people this is what i give them a structure to think about that are you getting to out of this three? like for example if i switched from i switched from let's say amazon to an academy mm -hmm. Am so amazon to an academy i took a pay cut oh because an academy was a startup i mm -hmm. took a pay cut so now obviously i would be maximizing on core competency and and growth yep. right so i joined them as a technical architect grew very quickly there yep. right from technical architect principal engineer senior em and director engineering right career growth sorted and core competency because i now know how startups operate that it's mm -hmm. not about writing really good quality code when you don't have a product market fit mm -hmm. it's about scrappy solutions like finding all sorts of hacks to sort it out right i optimized for both yeah right? from an academy to google when i switched mm -hmm. it was money so at an academy i was director of engineering at google i was a staff engineer yeah. so i gave up on my position mm -hmm. but what would i have maximized on money, money. and core competency mm -hmm. because at google scale i got to know how spark works the kind of deep tech problems google solve when i learned a lot there just although i left it within a like i basically left it in a year and two months but i learned a lot i went for core competency and money and i left position there that's a really good way yeah. to think about it uh, one of my friends also uh, mentioned these three p's but his three p's were different it was paisa project and people so it's like giving some importance to the mm. culture as well i think it depends um, on a person's character also yeah, like if they value culture at all because there are a lot of people who are um, they like to contribute to their workplace autonomously mm. like they don't care if the culture is mm. good like i'm here to get money get position and get career growth i don't care about people but if someone yeah. so if basically someone does care about working with people a lot more than other factors then obviously yes but if you keep adding more pieces to it it will become highly complex yeah. i like to keep it simple Be yeah. because this according to me this three is something that that a lot of people would relate to because people expect although it's a good point that you don't want to work with like really weird people but mm. uh, what are the chances because i would leave it to like if i'm like now that i'm building a company i would never be hiring people who are not good not just technically but even with good good behavior good people in general what do you yeah. look for when you hire when i hire for me the most important criteria is bias for action really mm -hmm. i don't want someone to just procrastinate and say hey i'll do it and sort it out so for me curiosity and like curiosity and bias for action is what i look for the most and then proven track record mm -hmm. because i don't want people who are good at cracking interviews and really bad at making real world impact mm -hmm. right yeah. so i i want to have proven experience so whenever i speak to people when i uh, when i had hired and now that when i'll hire in future this is a non negotiable for me does that mean that you are not open to hiring freshers who have not worked no, a lot no this is a very uh, this is a very weird thing like when we think of impact real world impact we suddenly discard freshers right it's yeah. not that freshers don't have real world impact it's in their in their case you can go for curiosity and high bias for action mm -hmm. you can drop down real world impact yeah right because they don't because they have not worked at a workplace before so obviously they don't have that sort of exposure but you can see how you can see how people are curious because yeah. for example i would not hire a fresher who is just good at solving code like who is sorry who is just good at solving let's say basically lead code i would not go for that i want someone who sees like oh let me try to build my own language hmm. let me try to go into database internal stuff i so i found this i i language. found this i am playing songs every day but how does this mp3 file look like oh like i want that curiosity because the person who is curious because i am a huge uh, like i believe in serendipity like you look for something you are going in the direction but you suddenly stumble upon something else which you have never thought of right and that's basically serendipity and i want diverse people who can think of something that i am because if i'm hire everybody who is good with lead code and everybody will think the exact same way and the product will look exactly like every other product right but if i'm bringing something new like for example i met a person named ayush uh, last week uh, he is building a programming language which captures the sound of violin and creates code out of it no see oh my that's God. so beautiful right yeah. right and so exciting this this kind of stuff i like hmm and now how why do these people reach out to me 
they don't reach out to anyone else because they know that you will value this i value this yeah. right and this is important like when you are curious and it's not you cannot just always say hey i don't require this at my job i won't do this that's mm. a very wrong attitude like according to me again other people no, can no, have different true. opinion but i value i value curiosity a lot yeah. because it just makes you it just like, imagine people like imagine this person who has tried building this programming language goes in a meet up and would have a such a beautiful story to tell yeah you are amazed when you listen like kya how how is this yeah, even possible like, right and that's the kind of people we want who can who can add value in 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 a discussion hmm. who have seen other stuff who like you just don't want to be surrounded by a bunch of yes men or bunch of homogeneous people hmm. you want heterogeneity you want you want diversity yeah it it should be a it should be a very diverse mixture like i i value that so i value curiosity plus bias for action that's not negotiable real world impact if experience otherwise for freshers no how the more curious the person is more likely i'm going to hire that person and that's where you can drop on real world experience because they're fresher right they have not yeah, seen plus not. i really think four years graduation time massive amount of time to do a lot of fancy stuff yeah i'll tell an example in 2010 um we had a subject i was in my third year we had a subject of uh, database management system I hated that subject. Now I love database, but I hated that subject. I did not understand why table, why ER diagram, and this and that. So we had to do a project. Everybody did, and I hated it. So why would I do that project? Like I did not like it. So me and two of my friends we teamed up, and uh, they were like, "Nee, we'll let's do a traditional project." I'm like, "I'm not going to create this table variable part." So you know what I did? I created a speech recognition, I speech controlled quizzing software. People can control quiz application mm -hmm. with voice commands. Oh, because I hated creating tables. I did yeah. not want to do that ER diagram fancy stuff. So what happened was, I created this. I I knew it was a basic prototype. It was working. I took it for the demonstration. Uh, my teacher asked, uh, and I was the only one who was demonstrating it. Like me and my two uh, teammates, we were demonstrating with headphones. We we went with our headphones on. And he just said, "Hey, why are you basically why are you wearing your headphones? Remove it. Show me the demo." Ma'am, I said, "Ma'am, this is the demo." I gave her the headphone and asked her, "Ma'am, say something." She said, "A," and A option got selected. She oh. said, "Next," and it went to the next question. Now this is what I value. like you need like although you don't like that thing it's okay but can you like you need to have that kida in you you need to do that jugaad yeah. and that is really important like and i'm talking 2010 when no llms no nlp stuff you know what i did i just was using windows operating system windows had inbuilt speech to text recognition although that was very average really very average uh, uh so what happened like well i'll just i'll just basically paint a small picture so when i used to say a mm -hmm. it used to detect as v w e i g h but i was saying a i'm like hey, why it's a why are you printing v mm -hmm. then i said a and for some reason he wrote a e e oh. i don't know what that word even is right so what did i do i did not say i would not use it i said if it says a v a all the things when i said a in different tones whatever word it detected i made it into a list and said if yeah it detects any one of this market is okay. hmm. it's a jugaad but it works now imagine i just converted a really boring project into something that i'm sharing after what 14 years yeah <laughs> right? 14 years yeah it is 14 years now right and that's what i love i want people to be curious i want people and again i'm not saying i'm the best one out there obviously mm -hmm. there are many many like superb engineers uh in the world but if i can just spark curiosity in few i will my 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 life is good so two questions there arpit how hard has it been for you to find people who are curious hmm. a b how do you spark curiosity in engineers you said that multiple times so i want to know what's your process okay so to answer the first one first one is super question how hard it has been for me to find curious people so one thing that i've done well is i've tried to put out my curiosity out and like attracts like mm -hmm. they reach out to me like like how like how ayush reached out to me uh, he took my course and he blogged one on one and when we were discussing he said that hey i'm building this language uh 
and I'll show you a demonstration next week. He blocked one on one next week also, and he showed me the demo. And basically, that's how I uh, spoke about it. So mm -hmm. from sound to code. So that is one. But one thing that I realized was uh, when I was at Google, at Amazon, at An Academy, I realized everybody is curious on some level. In most cases, their curiosity is curbed because of education system. And I'm not one who cribs about education system a lot because you can possibly cannot crib about education system after 10 years. Right? You are you're you're way past that. If you're still cribbing in your 30s that education system is bad, then something's wrong with you. So that's one. And uh, because of the work or the rat race that we are put into. Right? So some of the brightest engineers I've met, they were all curious who did not curb their curiosity. Mm -hmm. They were they were really curious about how these things work, not just going into internals, but just uh, hacking a solution out or building something fun, right? And a lot of them uh, in, uh, in a recent leadership meetup where I went, I figured out that a lot of senior leaders are actually curious, but in separate domains. They have, they have interest in history, they have interest in science, they have, they have interest except coding and except work. Now, curious engineers, like with, which is where the curiosity part comes in, like do you have something else than the work that you did, the school you attended, to talk about? Like for example, even when I gave you my intro, did I talk about the places I worked at? No. Yeah, no. Because that's not the most, like that's not the most interesting part about me. Mm -hmm. And I go by this, that people, like a lot of people did not even know I work at Google. Like on the other hand, if you see a lot of people just put out X Google, this yeah. Google, I work at Google on their video thumbnail, they put Google photo and this and that, right? But that's where the difference is. Like the, I, al I always believe that uh, the place that you work at should not be the most interesting thing about you. It should be much more than that. Right? Yeah. Now this curiosity part, just circling back to this, the curious people are someone who are beyond this who are just, they look beyond work. Even if they're working, they find something more interesting. Like, they're like kind of slightly crazy, but in a good way. Mm -hmm. uh, but they are, to find them, in interviews, what I do is, I probe them. I go into that side of thing that is hidden, or others, basically that is hidden between their lines on resume. The things you don't expect to mention in an interview. Yes. Yeah. In most cases, I talk there, I speak to them about their college projects. Okay. Because very likely they were their 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 curiosity was like you could see they are curious about something when they speak up when they speak passionately about something and in most cases it is their college projects or their time at college because after that you enter this rat race mm -hmm. lead code is that that and that a lot of things falter and very few people are able to sustain given the commitments and all but the college time is the one where I spoke about like for example. With respect to curiosity, I ask, hey, did you participate in uh, in any event where, let's say, uh, there are some entrepreneurial events that happen? Did you participate in that? How did you make money in case there is some? Mm -hmm. right? Or an interesting project? Or even if you have not done interesting project, which is the most interesting project you found? Mm. Or one question I asked very recently was, uh, what like which is the most interesting YouTube video you watched? Oh, That's a good question. Yeah. Right? And you would YouTube know. YouTube is a heaven for people who are yeah. curious. Yeah. yeah. So there are so, so, so many interesting things that people just look past. And this is, this looks like a very weird question to ask. Hey, what is the most interesting video I watched? In most cases, to be honest, in most cases, people don't have an answer to this. Mm. Which means it's not that you have to constantly work. But are you curious or not? Yeah. It's from this. Like if you ask me this question, I can talk about 10 videos that I watched that were that blew my mind. Mm -hmm. They were all around coding or around interesting hacks, but they worked. Like I again, that shows curiosity. Right? So to summarize the project's college or any interesting project that they saw, it shows that how keen are you in observing things? Mm -hmm. Because if they have a keen eye, they might not have gotten that opportunity to code due to any reason. Right? And an interesting one, which is the last YouTube video you watch. Yeah, that, that's a brilliant question. But you found Ayush. Right. Yeah. But how many people do you, uh, other than Ayush, how many mm. people have you been able to find who are as curious? Or do you find just like a general crowd doing lead code 
so most of them are there but again there is nothing wrong but the key thing is like they are there to get the job or to make the switch or make their lives better Mm-hmm. but uh, as i always say like uh, like it's a it's it's an old saying that uh, uh, philosophy is done by people with filled stomach mm-hmm. if you are good if you are doing well then you have time and luxury and privilege yeah. to explore be curious and what not right but uh, there are people who are curious who have done this sort of fancy stuff who i meet but to be honest there are not many Hmm. not many like not many. i would want more people to be curious and it's not a bashing against india but i've seen very few indians to be doing it i've reached out i've been reached out by a lot of folks from the west they are much more curious and again it's the difference in economy and a lot of factors but uh, when i tweeted about it a couple of days back i i got a lot of backlash on this right that i said that people in india don't love engineering much but i was just trying to spark that curiosity like you need to be little more curious and look beyond interviews mm-hmm. how long <laughs> like people keep just preparing for interviews like waste like people say like for upsc people waste 5 years of their life and yeah. end up doing nothing interviews are no like interviews are very similar to that mm-hmm. you are always in a constant thing of interview 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 and just grinding that same stuff again yeah in most cases after a certain stage it's waste of time you could do so much more like imagine as an interviewer if i talk about that i built a programming language that converts sound to code would that company not be hiring me even at least they would listen like yeah. this guy knows something different than others that's the classic case of when people can just hire on the basis of potential like oh this guy is curious yeah. he yeah, yeah he thinks like that i'll uh, we should tell you one more incidents from my life my first job that i got first job was uh, my uh, college placement 2011 and uh, i was not asked any technical question i was just doing normal conversation with interviewer so it was a company called sava softwares um uh, interview happened at 10 pm five interviewers in room right in front of me and i was one sitting here mm-hmm. and they asked me arpit uh, tell us about an interesting project the project i spoke about was something that i built uh, called uh, audio touch okay it was very nascent stage of android 2010 was android was just getting introduced mit media workshop happened in india uh, in my college so uh, and that was their first india basically mit media lab workshop or something happened and i was i was one of the few people from my college who got selected for it and there we learned android programming and it was very nice so all people from west they came and we were having this workshop and um, they were all researchers they were all phd holders so uh, mr ramesh raskar ha- uh, came we had a live session with uh, uh, basically pranav mistri brilliant like he he is my idol like the way he spoke about six sense technology it, it was a it was a viral video of 2008s and 9s sorry 2009 and 10 so uh, so just getting that opportunity to speak to the researchers who are working on that cutting edge stuff and that time android was the cutting edge stuff like no one imagined that i part. think you ended up working with them no 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 no, no, no. there was someone else i think uh, they are big 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 people <laughs> you are so, now also big 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 people no. <laughs> so pranav mistri uh, headed uh, uh, samsung think tank division brilliant guy brilliant guy his like just uh, folks who, who are watching this please search for six sense six sense technology pranav mistri he made me curious about computers so, like he what he did at the time he augmented real world into digital world before it was cool so uh, in his video he spoke about how he broke the computer mouse with the ball and created a hand glove out of it so that he could track hand movement over there brilliant video and like this is what i want to do mm-hmm. and uh, so when their their workshop was happening in india and it was happening in my college and i was one of the and i wrote a very real application for that i want to be part of this and there i got exposure to android and in 3 days we built a prototype called and i called it audio touch so but i just uh, when i was explaining to the interviewers it i spoke about uh, how it happened so the way we got that idea was about i saw my i saw my nephew he was writing he he, he, he was learning a b c d at that time he was writing a and drawing it like he was writing a and then saying a and then b and so on and so forth so i got this idea 
that what if when I write or rather when I draw on Android, what if I capture the sound that is happening at that time? Let's say when they write A, that sound gets captured in that shape. Mm -hmm. And then when I retrace it, it utters the same sound. Oh, I spoke about this project. No technical question. Like imagine me being this curious and showing that I have a working prototype of it and I showed them. They were like, you are in. Oh. See, and I, it's a classic and I'm not saying like, like companies do value diverse mindset. Yeah. And I brought something else onto the table. I brought curiosity. I brought out of the box thinking. I'm not saying like a lot of obviously companies have their processes and all you need to follow that. But it does not take a lot of effort to go thoda sa on the side and mm -hmm. do it, right? But if you come up with something interesting, then why not? Right? It just gives your life a spark. Okay. So that's what you try to do with your courses yeah. at Asli Engineering. I, I try to do that. Like I try to make them curious about stuff. Instead of saying this is the question, this is the answer. I take them through the thought process. Like why did they make a decision like this? Why not some other decision? What happened? Like what would their thought process be? Like what are the trade-offs that we are taking? Right? Like asking those whys and the hows and the whats. Right? Like going slightly deeper because a job is there but if we look at it we spend most of our life at work like basically working why can't we make it fun yeah why, why, why does it have to be like this is the work why, why why do you have to talk about monday blues imagine you are having a very fun side project because you love the domain you would be happy because you know even if your work is okay okay you are still making money but you are looking forward to something much more interesting Again, I might look psycho to a lot of people, but <laughs> that's yeah. how I am. That makes complete <laughs> sense because Monday Blues mostly would probably just occur because you are not curious enough to dive deeper into what you're doing. Mm. Because if when you dive deeper is when you realize how things are actually working. Okay. Yeah. And that's what, like it gives you back the passion. It does. So you you are a curious person and you, you try to give it to everybody who yeah. takes your course or through your YouTube videos and everything. Um, while I was researching, uh, while I was like going through mm. a profile, I came across uh, Rewind, mm. uh, which you're trying to rebrand as uh, Arbok. Arbok. <laughs> uh, that's a programming language that you're yeah. building. It's it seemed pretty interesting. It's for children. I um, I gathered. So could you talk more about it? what is it? My daughter was born in August. So while we were expecting, I thought that the first programming language my daughter should learn should be mine. The one his dad, the the one her dad created, and I and I always wanted a girl. So my wife was like, hey, "Why are you so sure it would be a girl?" I'm like, "Me, I want a girl. I want a baby girl." So I used to always call her, her, her every time. <laughs> right? So I like uh, I want her to learn a programming language which her dad created. So that was my and it was a very it was a very random idea that came. But I'm like, "No, yeah, this is dumb. Hai. Like I can build my programming language because I had." I loved uh, I loved creating some prototype languages mm -hmm. earlier. So I had that thing in mind that I, I can create one. So then um, um, August, she was born August 24th, 2020. And uh, 10th of October is when I made my first commit. When I'm like, after staying up whole night for two months, <laughs> and then the first phase was over, uh, that I now I can sleep because my daughter will let me sleep now. Then I uh, 10th of October as I made my first commit, on that to just test the prototype that can I write a parser for a like, like basically can I define a language, write a parser which converts it into a JavaScript code, runs in the browser and can people can create games out of it. So that end to end prototype was working. Then I was researching through and figure out there were a lot of languages and at that time, uh, which was that company, that uh, Chintu Valley company, uh, which was acquired by Baijus. Uh, uh, this one, I forgot the name. Ha, Mr. Whitehead Junior. So I went through that and figured out that they are all teaching it through Scratch, uh, the MIT Scratch tool, which is a block-based programming language. And uh, what it does is the children drags and drops stuff and they create logic out of it. I'm like, nah, yaar. coding is about writing. Mm. I don't want my daughter to do drag drop because it does not build logic. Because when you code real world, there is a lot of errors. Uh, uh, indentation error, syntax mistake, you have to read the error, understand what happens. Right? That sort of thing is missing. Mm -hmm. And I realized that because I coded from a very young age, I realized that that helped me right? when I made mistakes. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm like, I want to build a visual programming language and it needs to be very easy to write. 
uh, but it needs to help people like it help, it should help children create games out of it Mm-hmm. So I, when I met Pascal, I'm like, what should I name it? <laughs> like, screw it, rewind. I just <laughs> gave it a random name. Okay. But now that I know what I'm doing, like now I have time. Now that I don't have a job, like, uh, like a really designated job, job, uh, I can spend some time thinking about it. So I'm rebranding it to Arbok. Arbok is the name of a Pokemon. Mm-hmm. Arbok is a snake Pokemon. Reverse is Cobra. Yeah. That's why it's called Arbok. And mine is the syntax will be very similar to Python, oh. so that's why Cobra and Arbok. Oh, so this is the name you put how, yeah, it to. Yeah, okay. yeah. So I would want that. So I'm going on that. So the language is pretty simple. It will transpile Python into JavaScript and run in browser and create games out of it. How far are you into this? I have a working prototype. If we, if someone goes to rewind.arpitdhani.me, I'm basically building a Chrome dinosaur game that we have, a very primitive version of it. Mm-hmm. So, jump and it moves and it counts. That mm-hmm. part is working. How, how so, old is your daughter? Has she started? No, she's just three. Okay. So, she's, she's learning to type because it's it's difficult to write but it's easy to type. Easy to type. Easy to type. Yeah. So, she's learning to type. Because I'm not forcing the language yet. Five years later, I'll do it when she'll be in her fifth standard. Five, six years, six, seven years later. So when she'll be in fifth, fourth or fifth standard, where she would be genuinely interested. When she sees me code and all, she still asks me, "Papa, what are you doing?" She sees ID. Papa, that black screen is good. Mm-hmm. So I play around with this. Right. So she uh, day before yesterday, she told me, "Papa, what is that black screen you work on?" <laughs> oh, like, <laughs> she's already very yeah, curious. Yeah. Then she she's curious. She's uh, like she's very curious. She asks a lot of questions. Mm-hmm. So that is my motivation. Like you know, you need to have an intrinsic motivation. So yeah. my intrinsic motivation for this thing is to build a language for my daughter. Yeah. If no one else uses, I don't mind. My daughter should use it. She should be proud that her dad built a language that she can learn. What if she doesn't want to? It's okay. I'll play. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's okay. It's okay. But eventually, the way I look at it is, she will have to learn coding because mm-hmm. it's a must-have skill. Yeah. Because more about it's not about coding and doing software engineering, but the way coding helps is it gives you a very structured way to think. Yeah. About anything and everything, mm-hmm. you can break it down into smaller problems. You take step by step. Right. So, given and given a tough situation in your life, you would always want to tackle it in a structured fashion. Yeah. And coding has given me that framework. Okay, how to tackle any ambiguous problem, not just coding or at work or even in life. How do you tackle it structure in a structured fashion and learn anything and everything? So, yeah. she would need to learn in some other way because we don't know how the landscape would look ten years down the line. But she would need to learn some of the other parts of it where you can code in. Computers or something. Yeah, I have seen this thing in a, a lot of people who are actually thriving in this industry, who are like founding a technical mm. um, founding members of a company. That they have a lot of curiosity and like they have a structured way to think about things. Yeah. And also, as you mentioned, they have things beyond work that they're more interested about. Like, like a good engineer could be like interested in farming also. Like, yeah. right? Because it's just curiosity in general, not just about tech. Just look at the founding team of Cred. Yeah, they are not just someone who just codes, 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 or just works, mm-hmm. works, works. They were in a music band. Like, wow! <laughs> this yeah. is like just look at all the all like all sorts of cool people you 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 aspire to be. They have yeah. a personality outside their work. Yeah, right? and that's what and I really want like people to not just be stuck with the work, even if they are work. Like for example, people who sat with only talks about studying and working and all but even while doing it i'm not just talking about the work i'm doing for a company i still have although i'm deeply technical but i would still want to but i still touch upon different fragments of work mm-hmm. like of the domain not just limit to one it's so just that curiosity and bias for action comes in. perfect now um as I said in the introduction that we're mm. going to talk more about entrepreneurship as well. Mm. And I'm very curious to learn more about Dug Up, which is the recent um, mm. venture that you've started. So could you talk more about what Dug Up is, what you're trying to do with it and why? Uh, what we are trying to do, it's an interesting problem to have. Uh, like what we realized is um, LinkedIn is slightly weird. Like LinkedIn has become weird. LinkedIn is trying to become a content platform. Mm. Content platform and it is promoting engagement. Yeah. 
and this is a place where it be, it is becoming really difficult for people to be authentic mm -hmm. everyone is wearing a mask on linkedin absolutely they just follow the same uh, format a picture and a hook and some content and conclusion uh -huh. you don't even want to read that anymore yeah. so good people who have good stories to tell good knowledge to share are they putting out on linkedin not really because Or they even they, they, they are, it's just the same repurposed content No, even if like I'm saying, like someone new who wants to start and put out stuff on LinkedIn, are they like is the content is the quality of the post judged by the content or by the engagement? It's okay. by the engagement. By the engagement. Right, and which is why you see selfies and photos and all and all. Even like the way I say it is that the worst photo of this goes on LinkedIn. The best one goes to Instagram, Instagram stories. Yeah. <laughs> then on in, then on Instagram post. Then Snapchat, and then the worst one goes that. there, right? <laughs> the picture which is rejected by all social platforms goes, goes to LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Right? I believe that's where the problem is. Mm -hmm. That you like, and you, when we still see people commenting, "Hey, LinkedIn is not Instagram," but this, but that gets engagement. Right? Mm -hmm. So what we are trying to do is, we want to be an authentic platform. So way way we are putting it is as. Like we always like we say that uh, a company's reflection of the founders, right? Oh. If I am no fluff, my company will be no fluff. Yes. Right. So my co-founder Krishna is also no fluff. He also puts out genuine stuff about career growth. Right. Mm -hmm. He was head of engineering at Amazon. He was VP engineering at Better Up before starting up Dug Up. So we both are no fluff. We both resonate really well. So because we both are no fluff, the platform we create will be no fluff. Yeah. right because that's how it works so given that uh, we said that what is something that people in tech would want it's being authentic like everybody would need have something that they can share like i shared so many stories today mm -hmm. everybody has some other story to tell interesting project interesting work that they did how they thrived sometime a time that they broke production so many stories why can't there be a platform to share it mm -hmm. so a no nonsense low regret social network for people in tech specifically for people in tech because you know our audience is tech it, mm -hmm. it's easy for us to put in there sure and understand what they would want we might expand mm -hmm. but uh, for now we aim to solve it for tech because we understand the psyche of the people we understand the value addition that they would need to get and what not so it's easier to to put ourselves in their shoe right yeah. and we don't want 1 million post a day yeah. we want authentic post so it yeah. will be really authentic platform where people would share and it would be low regret so it would not be like on instagram you spend 30 minutes watching reels and you like are yaar sir time waste ho gaya right you feel guilty of doing it right this is a place where we want to have low regrets you should not be feel regretful ki are why why did i spend time it should give you value and it value and when i say this people always say hey yaar i just don't want gyan i just don't want only knowledge stuff i want something else also what's better than stories yeah that's right um and you can't really judge the stories a person has based on their content because everybody is performing on the social media linkedin wants a certain kind of content yeah. you're creating that um i see my friends hmm. some of them have really interesting stories to tell one of my friends got um um admits from two ivy leagues hmm. couldn't uh, take that for some reason and then he started uh, building in no code hmm. so that's a very interesting story according to me like yeah. right it's a very interesting story but when i see like what what they're doing on different socials is trying to feed the algorithm yeah linkedin wants a certain kind of content they're putting that out because whatever it takes to go yeah. viral or get engagement they will do that So that's why dug up is very interesting to me. Also, you talked about low regrets, hmm. and I've never seen somebody talk about that because whenever you want to build a social media platform, you want to just make it as addictive as possible. Yeah. Because the more the time people uh, they the more uh, time people spend on the platform, the more money for you. Yes. Right. Yeah. So um, it's interesting that you're thinking about it um, in a way that can positively impact people. It again boils down to how founders are. How far right? is that? Yeah. Uh, so we don't spend a lot of time on social network, like doing nonsense stuff. Hmm. Right? And again, nonsense is for us. That's nonsense. For others, it might be good. And right? so we don't do that. So we even we try. We do like we want platform to be engaging, 
and we don't want but we don't want people to be addictive to it also yeah. it should be low regret and obviously when it's slightly information heavy i'm not saying knowledge heavy it's something it's slightly information heavy after some time you don't automatically stop mm-hmm. but imagine you reading three amazing stories like people watching this podcast they yeah. would be curious by now are ye, ye, this is an interesting project like i'll also build a programming language now right yeah. now imagine is this story they read on daga would they not be inspired they would be inspired yeah. and it's not false motivation it's authentic stories so what it we are is. going for is authentic you where content wins and not engagement engagement will happen yeah. but it's how the fo- like it's who the founders are mm-hmm. how they think are they trying to build platform for millions if they happen it happens we are not saying we don't want to build for millions we want to build we want millions of people to tell their stories but more importantly be authentic on the platform yeah the way you put forth your vulnerabilities also like for example the time you broke production yeah right it's okay everybody learns from their mistakes yeah right now this is how we thought of that need a platform like this yeah. need a platform where people can tell their stories now, a lot of people say hey, why not a blog i can start a medium blog it's a it's a, it's a very valid point right mm-hmm. but does medium blog serve that purpose imagine just one place Even where on you can there's a lot of fluff right uh, now it's all chat gpt content yeah <laughs> right? but authenticity is something that yeah, truly inspires saying. because you can ask again chat gpt to give yeah. you a really um motivational inspirational made up shit but that doesn't have any real impact it's just like putting things in the void impacting nobody they are words and not they they are basically syntactic words having no semantics <laughs> oh that's a good way to <laughs> they are just that, words yes. that is being put out but no soul no 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 meaning to them it yeah. just bluntly written obviously no matter how good ai becomes when a person speaks their hearts out like the way i was talking about i'm very passionate about this stuff and when we speak the when when we speak our heart out people relate to that and people know when it's true and when yeah. it's not yeah. you, when you um, so usually what i do is i write things on my own mm. i li- i love to write so even if it's just a tweet or a linkedin post or whatever it mm. is i like to write and people no that when it's not chat gpt generated yeah. they're like we love it that you write on your own i was like wow i didn't even mention <laughs> that but and i i've got it uh, i've talked to my friends a lot about this and they're like when you write um authentically and when you write in your own style mm. it doesn't have to be too different from any what anybody yeah. else is doing but people can still so, tell that apart yeah so true. yeah and that's what we are trying to solve again we don't know how it would pan out either we would be the most stupidest people on earth or we would be the genius ones out there so we That's would be we would be getting a polar reaction either this yeah. or this and we are fine with either because it's okay to be misunderstood because but if the platform helps people or if people get value out of it then why not i am honestly very excited about it uh, my another question is that social media is a very difficult space to build in i feel because it's difficult to get people to shift from one social media mm. that they're heavily using mm. like let's say if you try to build another instagram that is going to mm. be insanely difficult right yeah. so building social media in general is very difficult so why did you decide to delve into this space specifically so one thing we realized was uh, again as you very rightly said like we need to we need to get the slice of people's time the slice mm-hmm. will come from existing social media right few minutes from twitter we take few minutes from linkedin we take mm-hmm. but then why would people give us few minutes of their time there has to be a differentiating factor yeah right now one thing that we see a lot of professional social networks coming in a lot of social networks coming in they are trying to feed on the hate for linkedin mhm right? and it's a and it's not hate following but more importantly like people have realized that it's slightly going on a cringier side and false and under the fake side of things and again nothing against linkedin i built a massive audience there uh but thing is that a lot of people that when someone on linkedin criticizes linkedin the number of the engagement that post gets is insane yeah i did a tweet another day hmm. um talking shit about linkedin and another person took my tweet copy pasted it on linkedin and they got re- more yeah. reach than me so like so it's very weird it's a it's literally a love hate relationship yeah you hate this but you're still doing it yeah right so there has to be a reason behind this like people 
are using LinkedIn because they get both the stuff. They get entertainment also because it's not just knowledge, 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 gyan, gyan, gyan. And they get gyan also because there are some accounts which post mm. good stuff, right? So it's a very nice blend and LinkedIn has cracked it with their algorithm. Yeah. Right? But if you see, if the most, if the, if an engaging tweet or engaging post is about, on that platform is about that platform being bad, tell something that there is a need. Mm -hmm. We are not saying what type of need it is. There is some need. Yeah. Right? Now, which is where we said that it's easy to take out someone's share of time from LinkedIn. Because it is possible, given there is some hate. Can we fuel into it? We are not going to say that LinkedIn is bad. That's that's never going to be our pitch. Our pitch will be about how we are different from others. Yeah. Right? You we'll we'll never say you that we will never say that uh, this is one thing that you have to come to mm -hmm. or this is anti LinkedIn. No. We will be working with each other because LinkedIn is a good place for you to get jobs. It's a good place for you to show your professional work. Perfectly fine. But there has to be a place where you can tell stories. Yeah. Right. So we we are not anti Twitter, anti LinkedIn. We are just trying to take some share from LinkedIn, some share from Twitter. When I say share, some time, some time share from there, mm -hmm. and build and add something which is authentic, which is a uh, differentiation that people should see that this is something different. Because I we, because if we just create yet another social network, like for example Snapchat, why did Snapchat mm -hmm. win? Snapchat came up with stories. No one had that when Snapchat yeah. came. Right. Snapchat did that one well, you view the photo once and then it vanishes. Right? Yeah. They added that new part and that became a hit because that was something new. For example, Be Real got a very nice traction mm -hmm. because it just opens your phone camera at once, it gives a notification, you open that, it, you, you click a photo and you just post it. Right. Mm -hmm. So when, unless you add into a social network that is adding a differentiation, you would not win. Yeah. So for us the differentiation is story. Right. And why social network? Because there was mm, like we are like I have built social following 250k across socials. I like and I've realized that people like some people like me, the way I approach things, the way I speak, the way I communicate, the way I spark curiosity and all. And I'm like, this is a good place to be in because we could build a SaaS, but is it that exciting? Mm. Mm, not really. Like because you as a founder, you don't play your weak cards. You play your strongest yeah. suit. Right? Which is our strongest suit? Social media following, mm. my ability to do YouTube videos. So content is where I thrive. Social media is what I know how to build. With my experience, I can build scale stuff. So it looks like some nice place. And again, our idea might falter. Like two years down the line, no one would have heard of Dug Up. It crashed. It could happen that we go, we go berserk. Like we go really big or we go bust. Right? But is is this the shot that we would want to take? Yes. Yeah. Do we have what it takes? Yes. Do we have the clarity at this stage? Yes. But we don't know how people would react, and that's where the uncertainty of startup comes in. High risk, high reward. Yeah. So that's something that you can figure out later. Figure out. That you can't really figure out right now, of course, unless you have users. If not, this will go without some but, other idea. <laughs> yeah. Entrepreneurship is like that itself. Like you, you do, you don't marry an idea unless it, unless you find a product market fit. You are open to anything and everything. Mm. But it, we'll see where it but goes. But hearing this much about Dug Up, I have a positive feeling about it because um, as you mentioned, every social media, main social media platforms that we see, they have something core uh, to it. Like mm. if I uh, have five social media apps on my phone, there is a purpose related yeah. to each. Yeah. I go to WhatsApp for chatting. I go to Instagram for posting mm. pictures on Twitter to just write out any mm. thought in my mind. LinkedIn to find jobs, mm. Snapchat to just record a moment yeah. and send it to somebody, right? Yeah. So there is some uh, core purpose. Adding to that it. blind grapevine, solving anonymity, yeah, being yes. brutally honest. So yeah. Dagup is yeah. solving a very real problem. So, well, we'll it's so exciting. We have a, like, solving real problem is a question mark. <laughs> we yeah. have a differentiation, right? But it totally depends on how people react. Yeah. And right? if they want it, because we don't know if you're building a vitamin or a painkiller. Hmm. People don't pay for vitamin. We all have yeah. vitamin D deficiency. <laughs> I can <laughs> everybody has it, right? But do we pay for vitamin D tablets? We pay it when we see the negative effect. Right? Yeah. Is this a painkiller for people? We don't know. You'll figure out when you uh, get users. Yeah. Yep. Arpit, now I want to dive um, more into how you do so much that you actually do. Uh, I've gotten some questions from Twitter, so I'm going to, I've chosen three of them. Mm. So I'm just going to ask you those. 
uh, the question that they ask is how do you wake up in the morning and find motivation to do everything under the uh, real engineering umbrella so, asli engineering asli umbrella engineering. that's a hashtag that came you know that also has an interesting story again now you see we when we have a conversation we always start so with that right stories, we always yeah. say with stories and now you see why we relate so much with dug up yep. right so uh 2020 when i was like sorry 2021 when i was thinking of something i used to write a lot on linkedin and all i'm like yeah like why other thing is not and at that time i uh, watched uh, i watched basically gully boy second time uh -huh. so if you look at asli engineering font it is very similar to gully boy's font oh the oh. font of rebel right right that right, thing right yeah. as if you are basically spray painting mm -hmm. a wall so that's how i chose that logo and basically there is a red patch behind it it used to be pink and then i changed it to red mm -hmm. because that's how wall graffiti would look like uh -huh. like someone just smashing uh -huh. it and just writing asli engineering right. so that's the story behind it and why i chose that word because i want i wanted people because i realize that people rally behind a mission Mm -hmm. and your mission cannot be to crack interviews like it should be much bigger than yeah. that right so i'm like what is that word that people will like asli engineering because i wanted to hit the nail on the head so mm -hmm. that's why i chose asli engineering as a word now what motivates me to be honest it's again circling back to the first thing it's i want people to experience the joy that i had mm -hmm. when i first uncovered those concepts mm -hmm. I'm not even kidding uh, uh 2021 when i started my course um i do a lot of prototypes so i was building my own load balancer as a small prototype on my local machine uh, i was at my in-laws house um and i was prototyping load balancer golang create bunch of go routines and sort how it is balancing the load implemented consistent hashing hey did it like did it balance or not it worked i was so happy i explained it to my mom in law my dad in law everybody whoever i could find ki dekho it's working dekho now i they don't understand i i did a control c on one window and they saw the load moving to other they are yeah, how good good beta good <laughs> <laughs> but i like like people get kick some people get kicked by drinking by smoking and all i get kicked by knowing stuff mm. by understanding why it works i like that then again it's not that i want every everybody in the world to be curious but i'm just putting out myself i don't i i'm not here to gain lot of followers if people relate they follow mm -hmm. if i would be craving followership i would be putting out stuff that is meant for that platform on that platform i would be putting out selfies <laughs> there yeah. on linkedin and all for me i'm really authentic i'm i'm and i'm a really simple person i want the joy that i experienced there has to be a way for me to channelize it into something mm -hmm. now it is youtube earlier it was blogs every day i read something because i cannot like every day i put out something interesting on linkedin and twitter if i was not reading it how would i be writing it because it's not chat gpt generated right i've been writing it for 8 years yeah. there has to be something that motivates me and for me it's literally my passion to learn my curiosity to know my bias for action to write hey that's very good why i'm talking <laughs> <laughs> my bias for action to write and uh, in a way it inspires people and that's a by product i never see inspiring people as my primary purpose my primary purpose is to uh, quench my thirst to know to understand to share because that's how i'm built yeah. if other people relate they follow and if yeah. you see people follow authentic people yeah if if if, if someone is made up like the way the way the kardashian sister like we are going from here to here okay the way the kardashian sister became famous because they were very authentic when they started their when they started vlogging in mm -hmm. the first place they were really very authentic right yeah. the way the way lily singh became famous again i'm talking old type emma youtubers chamberlain, the uh, emma chamberlain is a huge vlogger and she started daily vlogging and she was just raw yeah she was just showing her daily life like i'm eating an orange yeah <laughs> like that's how people started yeah. following her and now she's so big yeah and that's how like if you see basically tanmay bhat's reaction his vlogs so authentic right yeah. he does not like he is very natural and it's not that he's acting mm -hmm. but you relate to people when they are authentic if they are makeup if you if you just put a mask every time and don't want people like that now um i have heard people talk about this like i've also heard mm. this in other podcast when somebody start wants to start a personal brand uh, the big creators usually what they recommend is niching down yeah. right so when you're talking about tanmay bhat 
Tanmay Bhatt, you can't really define him. He's a comedian, yeah. yes. He does ads. He is now on podcasts. He's mm-hmm. on every other Nikhil Kamath yeah. podcast. So, Nikhil, so, so Tanmay Bhatt like, can't be put into a word. Yeah. But now that's the case for somebody who's gone so big. Mm. But when somebody is just, you know, um, somebody is a nobody. Hmm. They're just starting out. They're recommended to niche down. Yeah. So that's why they have to sacrifice on their authenticity. Why would you need to sacrifice on authenticity when you're creating because, when, because you want to feed the algorithm. You want to get engagement. You want to grow. That's what I see a lot of people doing. But this con- with this contradicts our earlier point where you be authentic and people will follow. Yeah, so that's a, it's, it's, it's a, uh, you need to strike a balance. Right? You need to, you still need to follow the algorithm of the platform. Mm-hmm. Right? But not succumb to it. Yeah. Right? And that's the thing. People succumb to algorithm and that's where the problem happens. Yeah. You don't need to like, for example, I put out stuff on LinkedIn without adding a photo, still get decent engagement. But what kind of people am I, am I engaging with? Hmm. That also matters. The yeah. quality of your followers also matters. I'm not saying others are bad, but do I want to talk to those people mm-hmm. the way I am? I might not. I might not want to. Yeah. Because they are not relating, they have different priorities and it's perfectly fine. Eventually, if they like my stuff that I put out, they would follow. Right? And one thing that people do is they think of personal brand when they're putting out. You should not think of building a personal brand. Mm-hmm. I'll tell one more story. I wrote a really weird stuff where I was at Amazon. I was getting bored. Uh, I wrote, I created a character. So I'll start from beginning. So what happened? I was at Amazon. Uh, Tuesday or Wednesday afternoon post lunch I had a paper cup in which drank water uh, some water got spilled on my desk mm-hmm. small water and I had that cup empty I drew eyes on it drew a face on it and uh, I put it there it looked really nice I clicked the photo hey, this, this is really nice and I made a Instagram post about it right? and I just wrote uh Mr. Cup, I gave it a name, Mr. Cup, weird name. Mr. Cup was sad because something bad happened. What happened to him? We'll find out next. Random stuff. Hmm. Totally random. I'm tech person writing this random stuff. Right? I did not do it for algorithm. I, yeah. I just posted it. And then next day, I did the same thing. I made a very small paper plane, put it in the water. That he spilled water on the paper plane and it got oh. mushy. Now he's sad. The plane was of his friend. His friend will be angry. So he, he got a lot of papers and created a plane out of it. That, so that he was lonely. He wanted to make friends. He had few friends. He, 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 he did not want to disappoint them. Mm-hmm. So and so. I built like 10, 11 part story around it. And, but here, did I do it to get followers? No. I, but I wrote about it. Mm-hmm. Because if I try to think, hey, I want people to think about me a certain way, mm-hmm. then I would be doing that. Again, I realize that I'm not a good writer, but I still gave my best. And then I put out my Today I Learned post. Today I Learned where I shared etymology facts, uh, science, history, maths, etymology, astronomy and miscellaneous facts. Yeah. I shared that. Then I went into technical part. Now the thing is, if you think of personal brand from day one, you are again trying to put a mask. Yeah. That this is who I am and people should not think about me in any other way. Mm-hmm. Right? I would choose not to do that. But again, while succumb well, like while uh, while respecting the algorithm yeah and that is slightly important because you cannot just put out let's say deep tech stuff on snapchat <laughs> yeah that wouldn't work yeah. like deep tech stuff on instagram because people are not on instagram to learn deep tech stuff mm-hmm. that's why i don't even have an instagram active like an active instagram account based on the type of content you put out mm. um, you will attract the kind of yes specific like if you are just pushing pictures on linkedin then you will Attract that kind yeah, of people. Like, and it's okay. People. If you want to engage with those kind of people, yeah. well and good. Yeah. Right? If But if you want to engage with, uh, let's say, senior engineer, like in my case, I love to have deep technical conversations with people. Mm-hmm. How do I attract deep technical people? By putting but, out deep yeah. technical stuff. Right? If That's I put how out, you meet other people who are interested in the same. Right? So, in last one week, I met six founders because I want mm-hmm. to talk to them. Yeah. I want to know how they think. When I speak about my idea passionately, I see passion in them. I see the same, same, bye, bye. Right? Yeah. And that's what matters. right? And then if the kind of stuff I'm putting out is the kind of people I would attract. right? Yeah. If I, I put out engineering stuff, deep engineering stuff, I attracted senior engineers. 
if I put out, if I suddenly start putting out product stuff, I would attract put product people. Right mm -hmm. now, when you're talking about niche, yes, you need a niche to start. Like uh, these are startups work. Like for example, Paytm was a wallet. Mm -hmm. They found a gap, wedged their solution, and then expanded. Amazon was a bookshop. Mm -hmm. They wedged their solution and expanded. Right? Mm -hmm. That's how every startup works. Every person works. Even when you join a friend circle, you add a new thing in the value. Be friend with one person and then expand and, and then, make yeah. friends with other. And that's how the world works. Yep. Right? So finding a niche, having a niche is important. But be authentic rather than forcing uh, the stuff to that that hey I want to build an engineering brand I'll just put out engineering stuff but if it is not authentic if it is not real you mm -hmm. people would relate like, yeah, copy paste yeah and that's when people would run away yeah. people don't run away from my post because of this like one of the reason being that uh, they know that I'm not copy pasting it from chat GPT I'm writing it on my own I'm putting my heart and soul every word matters I wrote a bunch of one liners uh, back in the day I call it Smarter Chimp see I did so much of stuff mm -hmm. I call it Smarter I have a Twitter handle called the Smarter Chimp mm -hmm. where for two years I posted one liner and that one liner had just five words six words that's mm -hmm. it like like basically banger of one liners that, and I used to think a lot mm -hmm. so for example I have a good one which says um, don't limit yourself with someone else's curation Oh, that's good. If a person says read this 10th paper, you read this 10th paper. If a yeah. person says read this, why not? Why, why, why are you not reading 11th paper? Yeah. Why are you limiting yourself to someone else's curation? Yep. Yeah. Why is people just blindly following, hey, what did this person do? I'll just do that stuff. Right. So I have many such one liners. And I've just, I think a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I observe a lot. Yeah, there's so many of them and I love writing this one and which is why my posts are quite crisp. Mm -hmm. I try to say a lot of stuff in very few words. Yeah. So again, you see a lot of like I have a personality outside work. Yeah. And over time and this is what your like it, it's a it's a it's something that a lot of people say like your personal brand is not what people say in front of you but behind your behind back. your back right? for sure. So when people talk about me, they don't talk about they just talk about oh, yeah, Peter. He, he puts out some good stuff. Although they might not be actively consuming it. So, um, another question that I got from Twitter was about imposter syndrome. Hmm. Now, when we look at you, we see somebody who has uh, worked, who has had this amazing experience over uh, the time of a decade, who is now working in their own startup, who has, um, who is having basically a really positive impact on people. Hmm. But, are you also susceptible to imposter syndrome somewhere? Because, I've seen this in a lot of people and in myself, whatever I'm doing in career and personal life, there is always someone doing uh, better. There is always someone one step ahead of me and I don't look back. I look ahead and I see, okay, this person is doing better than me mm -hmm. and I'm not. So that's when like that imposter, imposter syndrome comes in and have you face that? So if I say no, then I would be lying. Everybody yeah. faces it and it's, see, it's good and bad both. Uh, imposter syndrome, especially like, so long as it is not, it is not damaging you, it's okay. Mm -hmm. So long as you can take it in a positive way, it's okay. Because there might be a case where, let's say, you shot for the stars. You went to a really awesome place. Really awesome place or be surrounded by really awesome people. But you know you are a misfit. Mm. You know you did, like you are not at par. And if it damages your confidence, it then it becomes traumatic. Yeah. Right? So, Imposter syndrome, everybody gets it, especially when they join a new job, change their tech stack, see someone really smart. And it, it's a very known thing that we typically take a negative thing, uh, like the impact of a negative thing is 3x versus a positive thing. So when you hear a negative stuff, it impacts your brain thrice as more yeah. uh, than a positive thing. For sure. Right? So because of that, we always think that, hey, I don't know stuff. Although like, Obviously, that other person might not know the stuff that you know. You had their, you had your own journey. Yeah. You know your own stuff. Like you, like there are something that that person doesn't know. But we typically focus on things because we see it in context. Like, hey, it worked. He is doing really well, or she is doing really well. I am not. Yeah, but this in one specific. In context. one specific thing, and which is okay. So, which is where, so long as it is not damaging your mm -hmm. confidence, or it is not rather, it is not rather basically shattering your confidence. It's okay. Yeah. So long as you're able to cope up. 
brilliant but imposter syndrome should be there like even right now i have imposter syndrome that hey how how, how will i build this company I, there are so many good people and they can crush us and this and that but or or like am i good enough to lead a team of let's say 50 100 people right that happens but if you have the right attitude that i or and the confidence that hey i'll be able to do it might just take a month here or two then it's okay but if it is shattering my confidence and that is where you see people stepping down Mm-hmm. that it is not it is like i'm like it's deep inside it's like i'm not good enough to lead when someone else might be better to lead mm-hmm. if you have confidence go for it some imposter syndrome is also essential for you to go because that's how you know you are going to the next level yeah. right otherwise you are just stuck in your own bubble it just means right. that you you care and you're reaching uh, for something that's bigger than bigger you. than you and i think over a period of time Imposter syndrome, as you said, doesn't go away. So you have to find a way to work around it. Yeah. I have this, but I also have to do the thing yeah. that's bigger than my size. So I have to work around it. Okay. Um. Another. Uh. And this is the last question. This is what we mm. do with every uh, episode in our podcast. Mm. I ask for an advice for a young person. If you could go back to your late teenage years, mm. what is something that you would do differently, if at all? So, uh, few things is if I look back. uh with the with the with the kind of context i have <laughs> i know that i was curious i know i was meant to be working in this field that is all good one thing that i did not do and i'm still not doing often is uh networking i'm really good i'm really bad with people mm. that is one thing that i would change and i would be networking more i uh, in case of fight versus flight i fly <laughs> I, oh. I fly really fast. <laughs> no, no, I don't want to deal with this stuff, mm-hmm. right? So that is one limitation that I have. That I, I, I try to run away. Like I used to run away far more than what I do now. Now I still face adversities, but uh, in flight versus fight, I fly, and uh, because of which also I shy away from talking to people. Mm-hmm. Like when I want to talk to someone, I'm like, hey, yar, why, 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 why am I bugging this person? because mm-hmm. i like to keep my conversations crisp and if i'm not adding any value why should i just give of give this give or basically jo wo call this particular basically call this particular person i have i i fumble even like now speaking i fumble because it sparked that it sparked that insecurity within me yeah and it happens right? i relate i'm i'm really bad so at it much. like uh, yesterday i got a call from a really solid founder and i'm like i should how, how how did i forget to wish him happy new year oh <laughs> and this is these are people skills that you need to have mm-hmm. like for example ankush keeps calling me and i i like are yaar i should call him sometime yeah. like, this is one thing that i don't have and this is one thing that i should work upon right now but if i were to change it i would do it right from my college days or like my late teens time that uh, i should be networking more but again I always believe that networking is not just about meeting people. It's, it's about, about when you have journals. when you have like you need to bring more to the table than you take. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So I should not just go hey hi bhai what are you doing this that. Mm-hmm. But is this conversation meaningful enough? Is the other person getting enough value from me? So I would still continue to maintain that. Mm-hmm. But in a way that I'm still maintaining healthy relations with people that dropping them messages giving them a phone call i'm really bad at like i have very few friends now uh, i have a lot of followers but very few friends and again i'm happy with the friends that i have but i would still want to build better long lasting relationship with a lot of people yeah a lot of good people which is what is missing so i would network more uh, because technically it's all good because you can learn engineering stuff it's you and the book or you and the code Here, here are people. Here, you humans, you are dealing with. Yeah. So that is one thing that I would. That's change. a really solid advice, and I can say that because I have practiced that. So I am also a very similar person, as you said. I would. Um, I'm really bad at, uh, you know, maintaining relations. Even so, I have uh, some. I have very few friends, mm-hmm. and those are the friends that understand that. Okay, she is not going to call me. Mm-hmm. So they call yeah, me. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Same. But that's not the case with everybody. So and also, fight or flight. Mm. because my first instinct whenever like there's an opportunity to meet people and talk to people i would be like no 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 i would ra- much rather not do it yeah. i would stay at home but then i've had to build this over uh, the last 2 uh, 3 years that okay that's my first instinct that's that's the thought that yeah. comes to my mind but it's just that you have to get over that first thought because as they say you don't get to choose your first thought yeah. you get to choose your second yeah. so you have to sort of train your brain like that and it pays off and i'll be honest i had second thoughts 
for this podcast. I was so scared. <laughs> oh God! Because I was thinking, and which is why when we were on that call, I said, uh, "Can we delay it to next month?" Yeah. <laughs> because I was in that mode. Hey, yeah. Can I avoid? Right, and again that happens because I know I'm not good at it, but I'm still forced. No, you're amazing at I, it, by I, the way. Yeah. Because um, we got to know that we're doing this podcast mm. two days ago. Yeah, you yeah. also and uh, me too. And usually we know like two three weeks beforehand mm. that we're going to shoot with this person, so we also have some context. I didn't have any context about you, right? Better, huh? <laughs> yeah, I didn't have any context, and you didn't know about this podcast. So it was like both of us taking a leap of faith. Yeah. And I enjoyed this conversation a lot. I'm not sure about you. Yeah, I did. But it was a great con. And before uh, shooting this podcast, we talked for like a half, like half an hour. Before that, I was like very scared. Like, well, what's going to happen? I don't even know this person, and uh, I don't know how this conversation yeah. is going to go. Will I even contribute anything? But with that brief conversation that we had before shooting, I was comfortable. I was like, with this, yeah. the person that you can have a conversation. Raw and authentic. So raw and authentic yeah. again boils down to the same but if you're raw and authentic people will love to have a chat with you you're not someone who is just trying to sell yourself yeah. like hey, i'm smart on the smartest in the room you need to open up with your vulnerabilities like how i fumbled when i was talking about it yeah. if i'm not opening up with the vulnerabilities how would someone else trust you yeah definitely but this backfires also <laughs> yeah you open about the vulnerabilities at the wrong place and you're gone <laughs> two sides of the coin yeah. <laughs> Anyway, Arpit, this is uh, where we end, and thank you so much for all the insights that you shared. You've provided insane amount of value, and uh, it's been—I've had an amazing time talking to you. Same. And I'm, uh, and I'm 100% sure that everybody watching this episode is gonna get amazing value from <laughs> this. So thank you so much for doing this, and thank you so much for coming on a short notice. Well, thank you so much. It was really fab, really human conversation. If I may want to put it, yeah. I opened up on so many stuff. These are something that I've never shared anywhere. But uh, thank you so much Good for asking for great question. <laughs> thank Super. you so much. Nice. First of all, before uh, diving into the podcast, I fucked this up. Can you start? Our <laughs> episode में आ रखा है बिस्लेरी. Feature हुआ था बल्कि proper. I'd like to cut here. I'll just take that call. It was important. इतना conscious कर दिया है ना? सब जी ये भी अलग रहा, वो भी अलग रहा. Arpit, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? Best. All good. All all. देखो मैं 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 सब हुआ. Arpit, how are you doing? Welcome to the. No. <laughs> <laughs> What is happening to me today? <laughs>